Okay, so hello everyone. So for today's video, we have a few special guests joining us. Uh, and they're all professionals who work in STEM fields in some manner. Um, and we want to put them in the hot seat today. Uh, not quite, but I'm just kidding. We want to ask some questions about their field, their background, and hopefully they'll be able to give us advice on navigating those fields, navigating STEM, um, being that this field is not as diverse or inclusive as others. Um, so we have one hour. I won't chat or ramble as much. Uh, so let's start by having everyone just introduce themselves so that we have some background about who you are. And um, if you can share a couple of things. So your name, of course. So share your name. Um, what is home or where is home to you? So if you want to shout out your city or if you're from a different island, um, what is home or where is home to you? And then a quick elevator pitch about what you do. Um, so if everyone can do that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just call out the names. I also put them in a chat in order. So I can start first. So my name is Tanasia Swift. Um, I work at the Billion Racer Project as the Community Reefs Regional Manager. Home for me is Brooklyn, New York. I grew up in Bed-Stuy, to be exact. Um, I still live in Brooklyn, but now in East Flatbush. And what do I do? So Community Reefs Manager sounds like a pretty ambiguous term. But we have reefs that are located around different locations in New York City, um, oyster reefs. And what my job entails is bringing students to the waterfront, teaching them about science, teaching them about the um, ecosystems in their backyards, and getting community scientists involved in the data collection. It's mostly students, but students are also community scientists as well. Um, and most of those students are within the inner city. So we'll go ahead and let's bounce around to Tatiana. And then as mentioned, I'll put the names in order so that everyone knows who goes next. So Tatiana, the floor is yours. Alrighty, so hi guys, my name is Tatiana Castro. Um, home to me, um, I currently live in Elizabeth, New Jersey, uh, but I was born and raised in Cali, Colombia. Um, and I grew up there until the age of eight, which is when I came to this country. I am currently the restoration field coordinator for the Billing Oyster Project. And my job um, allows me to make sure I coordinate um, the field events that we have. And I work uh, with my partner, Tanasia, on connecting students and community members to um, our different field sites so that they could come out and help out. And so pretty much I just have to gather all the field gear and make sure that everything's ready to go for the day of um, while we're out with students and the community members. Awesome. Bradley, you're up next. Hi, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm Bradley Watson. I am from the Bahamas, but I, I did most of my school, like my college education in the United States. Um, started out working with plants, looking, my goal was to work in agriculture. Um, and then I got drawn into ecology. And so instead of looking at a system that's just meant to serve humans, I'm trying to figure out how systems can serve people and uh, the nature that, you know, existed before we got here. Um, moved on after grad school to come back home to the Bahamas, and I work with Kirtland's warblers primarily. And so this is a bird that spends half its life in the United States, mostly in Michigan, the other half of its life in the Bahamas. And so it's an international organism. Um, it's kind of hard for you to say where it lives because it lives, it splits its time almost evenly. Um, and so my job is to look at, you know, finding ways to support this bird when it is in the Bahamas. And at the same time, I focus on native birds. And since I left school, I realized that most of my work is with people. So I spend a lot of time talking to people and trying to explain to them, you know, how these organisms exist in the areas around us and how we can have a positive influence on them and how they have a positive influence on us. Um, and that, that's what I do. Uh, so it's good to be here. Bradley Watson, nice to meet you. Hi everyone, my name is Rocio. I am the operations manager at STEM from Dance. Um, I grew up, I was born and raised in Brooklyn. Um, then I moved to Queens and now I'm back in Brooklyn. Um, so I guess Brooklyn is home and I'm from the Dominican Republic. Um, 
So at STEM from Dance, it's a nonprofit that uh, gives girls the awareness and preparation for a STEM um, career through the confidence building aspects of dance. So my job at STEM from Dance is getting like guest speakers to come in and speak to the girls about their careers, um, get setting up field trips to different tech companies, um, really to get exposure um, to the girls so they could see what's out there, what they can do, what a career can look like. And a big part of it is them seeing women of color doing this type of work um, so they know that they're able to do it too. Um, I also do a couple other things for the organizations, a little bit of fundraising, a little bit of marketing, um, but the most part is to kind of get those experiences for the students. So aside from our program, they can um, experience what tech opportunities they have around them in New York City. Uh, good afternoon, folks. My name is James Rogers. I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio. I presently live in the D.C. area, most uh, in Bowie, Maryland, more specifically. I am the Director of Food Safety Research and Testing at Consumer Reports. Um, you may know us about testing televisions and cars, but we also test food. And so I have a team of five people up there, very diverse team, actually. I have a biochemist from Nigeria. I have a microbiologist from Pakistan um, and uh, three nutritionists that work for me, and we test food. Um, Job-wise, I've been all over the place. I think our conveners, when we had our conversation, they kind of realized that. But right now, I'm in a nonprofit, consumer-oriented organization that tries to tell people the best way to eat, the healthiest way to eat, and the safest way to eat. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Yadira Hadlett. Um, I call Sunset Park, Brooklyn my home, um, though I am originally from Washington State, but I've been here for about uh, close to 14 years. Um, and I run uh, Sunset Spark, which is a creative tech organization that seeks to um, serve immigrant families in the areas of creative tech. Um, so I uh, design a lot of programs. I teach um, mostly robotics in schools, but also robotics to families and do some 3D printing classes with parents. Um, and actually, in the, just a wide range of uh, crazy activities and classes that I teach, uh, depending on what families are interested in. Um, yeah, <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> Are we up next? Who's up next? I'm up next? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tariq Mohammed, uh, not chairman, <laughs> chief operating officer of Original Man Scientific. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Okay. It, there may be a little noise in the background. That's a construction site across the street. But um, I'm chief operating officer of Original Man Scientific, which is a research and development company designed to bring research and development directly to your community. We help uh, set up a laboratory or maker space in that area for you to, to, develop, to develop your ideas. Um, I started with that one, but I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. My home is Harlem, New York. I grew up um, in Harlem from like birth up until say I was maybe 15. And then I moved to Richmond, Virginia uh, in 2009. And I've been here ever since. I spent a little time in Atlanta as well for, the, for about four years. Um, my primary background is biomedical science with a concentration on chronic diseases, bacteria, and viruses. I also help uh, design nutritional therapy programs as well as supplementation for different types of uh, uh, issues that someone may, go, may be going through. But my primary uh, research background and interest is in cardiovascular biology as it pertains to atherosclerosis, which uh, many of you may have heard, it's just a lot of plaque buildup uh, forming in the, in the human arteries. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, I hope I answered all the, the, uh, the questions initially. Thank you, Tariq. Um, Tariq, you wanna Yes. <clears throat> Peace, everyone. My name is Jabril Mohammed. I am born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, living in a few different areas as I grew up, I focused in most of my time in the Westville Plain, Mount Airy area, um, 
pretty much as I was younger up and through college. I am a civilian engineer for the United States Navy, focusing on combat support systems. Started in material science and engineering, then uh, quickly moved into mechanical engineering. I am also uh, working alongside Tariq Muhammad as the director of engineering for Original Man Scientific, which is again, a budding R&D company geared towards delivering the advantages of R&D to underrepresented groups and underserved communities. Uh, I oversee several different projects from app development, uh, web design, manufacturing, prototyping type projects, product, product design, and things of that sort. Uh, I have a growing interest in mentorship as it pertains to STEM and have pretty much been involved in STEM related fields or sciences ever since I popped out, for lack of a better word. Um, with that, I'm ready to get started and happy to be here. Awesome, awesome. That's pretty interesting. Um, so we'll move on to so the first question I'll actually direct to Tatiana. Um, so I was recently reading a or listening to a podcast rather that spoke about the importance of language and culture when teaching science in or urban communities. Um, so Tatiana, can you talk about how your upbringing has impacted how you do your work now, like the way that you interact in the field with students or why you wanted to do your work. Um, so how has your background and your culture impacted the field that you're in now? Alrighty, so as you guys remember, um, I was born and raised in Colombia. And um, in my country, um, there was a lot of opportunities for us to be connected to nature. In, de in different ways um, and so I grew up with like you know chickens and mountains and grass but I was also um, in the city so coming here um, to the United States I saw that there was a disconnect um, between um, how there was human interaction and nature um, there wasn't really like we weren't really coexisting um, in the way that I did when I was growing up in Colombia with my grandma and my mom so um, that kind of always uh, made me question, like, why is that? Why is there a disconnect? Um, so um, since I grew up in Colombia, I speak Spanish fluently, and I'm able to connect um, that with everything that's going on at home um, back in Colombia and everything that's going on here. So I'm able to communicate both in Spanish and English when I go out into the field. Um, when there's you know there might be like a, interviews that i can do in spanish and I, and i'm it allows me to really um share with everyone in my culture from my country and any other of speaking uh, spanish speaking countries of um, the work that we do and it's not just for uh, people that speak english that are able to understand but now i can use my language to be able to expand and explain what it is that we do and why our work is so important um and it also really allows me to talk to other um kids that are like, hey, you know, she's Hispanic, she's Latina, like maybe I can do that too, right? Um, like, oh, you know, she speaks Spanish, like if she's doing it, why can't I do it, right? So I think it's definitely interesting. Uh, it's really important for, uh, for kids to be able to see um, the work that we're doing and why it's so important, but most importantly to see people that look like them, that speak the same language as them, and that are even from the same country as them doing this work. It's really vital, it's really important, and I feel like my culture has allowed me to do that. Um, yeah. And Tatiana is actually, uh, we were talking, so as mentioned, Tatiana and I, we partner for the Community Reefs Program, um, and so we were talking about the fact of doing culturally relevant monitoring in the field so normally when we got into the field we're going to collect data but tatiana was like oh let's do a field event where we start off with a little salsa dancing because tatiana is actually a, a dancer she's really good at it so just finding ways to connect the students with things that they're familiar with um and just bringing them out into the field is, is something that uh she's she's amazing at so thank you tatiana um so bradley we're gonna move on to you so the next question is so typically in STEM or science, uh, there's a pressure to get things correct, whether it be in math or having the correct answer, not failing at something. So can you uh, recall a moment, whether it's like while you're at work or getting to where you are now, where you felt like you failed at something or you didn't get it right on the first chance and how did you overcome that? Um, so, uh... Yeah, failure is failure is your friend. Get used to it because it's uh, 
you can't avoid it. If you try to avoid failure, you'll avoid success at the same time. Um, I was, uh, my second year in college, I just moved to a new school. Um, I was taking a class called Ecology, which is about how organisms interact. And I worked with this professor over the summer on a research project. We had 12 weeks, to put something together, and there was like an international conference at the end of the summer. And I went to that conference with my poster, having only six successful runs of my experiment when I was hoping to have maybe 30. Um, and it was because I was afraid to expose where, what I didn't know. Um, instead of approaching my professor and saying, you know, and I'm, I'm having this problem and I tried this and I tried that, you know, I felt like I had something to prove. Like, I felt like I wasn't supposed to fail. You know, I was one of the only, I, was, I think I was the only black person there that summer out of, I think, like 12 students. Um, and I just, I just put all this pressure on myself when it didn't exist at all. Because my professor looked at me as if I was anybody else, or maybe even he was more accommodating and more available to me than other people. Um, and if I had made myself open, I could have taken advantage of that. And if I had failed halfway through that summer, I wouldn't have had to go to that conference feeling like, you know, I didn't do everything I could. So what I learned from that is, you know, people are there for you and you have to open up and talk to them. And once you've done your homework and, you know, you can prove like I tried, then the next step is to get somebody who's been there before you and get them to help you or ask them for help because you know, there's no point trying to do this alone. So um, I hope to never repeat that mistake, although I've come pretty close, like still learning that it's okay to fail. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's a great answer. We, we have a symposium and usually in STEM, there's all of these um, opportunities to do research. And I think students in their mind, they're looking to get it right. Um, but it's okay because a part of that is learning. If you did not get it right the first time, there are opportunities to make it better. So yes, that's a, a great answer, Bradley. Uh, Rosio, so the next question is for you. So can you talk more about, so STEM from Dance has a, a amazing mission. So can you talk about the connection between dance and STEM? Like how do the two intersect? Sure, so part of it is, um, hooking our girls with something that they're already comfortable with, something that they already do, whether it's professionally or in their room when nobody's watching, right? Like girls like to dance, they do it often. Um, so part of it is hooking them in um, through that way and then exposing them to the coding and like the engineering. And another part is that it allows you to think creatively and problem solve outside of the box, right? Um, so dancing just allows you to bring that creative side to things um, and it helps you persevere through your problems. Um, so for our program, we really focus on a, a end project that's a performance and it's usually in front of all of their classmates. It's like the school talent show or like the end of year um, presentation. So they take it super seriously and um, they're really excited. They're like, our dance needs to be on point for this, right? So as we're getting that energy, we're like, cool. So to enhance your dance even more, let's work on the tech. So different um, tech projects that we've done have been like a full light up suit. So they'll attach the LEDs, they'll cool the different colors, the different effects that they wanted to have. Um, some of them in incorporate like motion sensors. So they, we had one group of girls who wanted light up sneakers. So every time they did a step, the lights changed. Um, so they've done that. Uh, this summer, since we're like switching to virtual, we're thinking about like motion capture and animation and how we could incorporate that. Um, so once the girls realize what they can do with the tech and how much more it'll enhance their choreography, they get really into it. And they're like, well, maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do that. Um, and for the first semester that we work with them, we're giving them the project. Um, but the second semester, it's totally up to them. We're like, tell us what your dreams are. And we will figure out a way to make it happen and give you the tools so you can bring it to life. Um, so they come up with a lot of crazy things. I think there was once an idea to have some sort of swing. And we're like, okay, the way our budget is set up, we can't, we can't bring a swing. But let's see what else we can work with. Um, so it's really nice. And I think um, even the girls that are having a really hard time with the tech, they're so motivated um, to make sure that that end project um, looks great 
that they, they put a lot of effort into it. And because it's a group project, right, the whole dance, you're coming up with it together. Um, it's nobody's alone. You, you can um, reach out to other girls in the class, like, hey, I'm, I'm having a hard time with my code. Can you help me out? And it's much more welcoming, um, especially also because it's just girls. You don't have the, the um, distraction of boys. Um, so you get that feeling of sisterhood and it's your own project. You're coming up with the choreography. They're choosing the music. We're really there to just support them and make sure that they're, they're learning what they need to learn um, to make sure that that final project is great. Um, and usually at the end, because it's a performance, they have that like boost of confidence. Like we came up with this dance, we came up with the code, we put this all together and we performed it in front of our entire school and we got applause for it. Like that's crazy, right? Um, so it really boosts their confidence. Um, so I think adding that creative element to STEM um, is a great way to motivate students um, to learn more about it and to explore it. That's amazing. I think your program is, is awesome. So yes, kudos to you guys. Uh, Yadira, so the next question is for you. So I've heard a few students who I've worked with, you know, like they talk about the fact that sometimes their parents aren't enthusiastic or as enthusiastic as they are about either entering the world of science or STEM, or it's a huge learning curve. Do you have any advice for that student who is really interested and they want to get their parents on board, um, but they don't quite know how to do it? Because I think uh, Sunset Spark does a really great job at getting the entire family involved. Um, do you have any advice for that student? Yeah, I mean, um, that is a little tricky to navigate. And, and I, I'll just share that, um, you know, the parent engagement piece didn't, it doesn't look the same um, in one family than it does in another. And so early on in our work, what we realized, uh, and we work primarily with elementary uh, age students, so what we realized was that, you know, well, first off, there were a lot of parents who were actually uh, kind of interested loosely on some, in some of the activities that we are doing. And so that was a great way to bring them in at an early point, right? But then I think the trick was figuring out how to loop back so that it's not a lot all in one. It's just kind of like little bites here and there. So there's other opportunities for parents and, and, and the child to work together at you know, exploring different fields of STEM. Um, so I guess that's the first thing is you're not gonna get your parents on board tomorrow morning if they haven't been on board, right? So just like with any relationship, you gotta work at it, um, communicate your interests. And, and then also, you know, if it is intimidating, which we, we see that a lot with our adult students or even parents, it's scary for them. They don't, especially our Spanish speaking um, parents, like they'll see this and I'm like, uh, how, what does this mean? You know, we, this is all in English. And so we figure out ways to um, convey some of that technology or the concepts uh, in a very um, low tech way. Um, but anyway, I think, you know, at the crux of all of this is what we're really talking about is how do you build the supportive or this network of support, whether it's your parents, your brother, your sister, your cousins, right? The people that you interface with, chances are you are going to draw, you're going to be drawn to those who are like-minded. Um, so if you're really into coding, chances are you're going to, you're going to gravitate to friends or, or siblings, um, neighbors or what have you, who are also up for that. And that is the moment that you want to see. So that's that's going to be your, your support network as you continue building your skills and deepen your interests. Because as you guys probably already know, like once you start to um, tap into an interest, your mind just gets blown because you're, you're, you realize like, oh, I know just the surface. There's so much more there to explore. And so, um, yeah, I think having some peers with you in hand, but also I think, yeah, the whether it's a parent who might be a bit reluctant in helping, uh, I think it, it also has a lot to do with having the confidence to reach out to a teacher or another um, a, adult men mentor to, to help you find those other resources that you might not be able to identify um, you know, as a kid. So that's what I'd say. That's awesome. Yadira, you mentioned a point about mentor and having 
uh, support system. So I think that really goes a long way, um, especially for students who might not have that support, you know, immediately at home. Um, mm -hmm. So Tariq, the next question is actually for you. So you mentioned in your bio at the age of 19, you caught the attention of a researcher. Um, so do you have any words of encouragement or advice for students who are looking to find a mentor or how do you network? What would you advise a student who's looking for someone? And I'm thinking more so like high school students who are either going into college or students who are just getting into college. How do you find a mentor? Does it have to be someone who looks like you? How do you network? What's your advice on, on that? Yeah, that's an awesome question. As a matter of fact, um, the, the attention that I caught from the professor was from a project I started when I was 17. So from, for, the, so for the two years prior to me meeting the, uh, the professor, I was already grinding and doing as much as I could for my research. Um, I, th I think I was a junior or senior in high school when it started. I think it was the end of my junior year. And I was so obsessed with the project that it became, it became almost like, and it, this is something that, um, uh, excuse me, hold on for a second. There was something that um, Yadira was mentioning about your family members or friends being interested in what you're doing. It got to the point where that's every time someone saw me or saw my name, they thought about what I was doing because I was so engulfed in what it was. So that by the time I got to my sophomore, the end of my freshman year, which is when I met uh, that particular mentor, she was also interested in what I was doing. So when you put yourself in a situation where you're constantly grinding, constantly working to accomplish something, things start to attract to you. The things that you want begin to attract to you. It may not attract when you want them to, but it begins to attract to you. So we began talking and found out we had the same research interests and she was already doing research along the lines of the things that I wanted to do. But hers was more on the genetic side. Mine was more on the, uh, the uh, clinical side. But it was, so, it was so refreshing to have somebody that loved what I love and yes, it did make a big difference that she looked like me. I'm not saying that they have to, but it makes a big difference when the person looks like you. She was a black woman. I love women in STEM because they are the most encouraging and inspiring people on the planet. We, we know a whole bunch of guys in STEM, but women in STEM are off the chain, just saying. You know, so, um, but yeah, so, so the fact that, you know, I engulfed myself in what I wanted to do, and those different things were, and the things that I wanted to were kind, but were just being attracted to me uh, in a sense. And just being able to, to know what you're talking about. If there's something that you want somebody to help you with, make sure you know what you're talking about. I had to know what I was talk, talking about from the very, all, all the way to the very sophisticated aspects, the biochemical aspects of atherosclerosis. If I wanted somebody to help me with that, I needed to know exactly what I was dealing with how I wanted to approach it and so forth. And you may not know everything you need to know, and you may not know everything about what it is that you're, you're studying or how to approach it, but it does help to make sure that, hey, this is this, this is that, and you can come to a person and properly articulate what it is that you're trying to uh, accomplish. But again, don't be uh, shy or don't be uh, afraid to talk to someone. Uh, if you're in, see, I met, I met that particular mentor in a science class, it was biology class. So the environment was conducive to talk about science. So if there's a mentor that you're trying to approach, try to meet them halfway or meet them where they are. Go to their office, uh, see about um, getting on their schedule or something like that. Don't be afraid because the fear is something that's going to cause you to regret for the rest of your life. There's nothing worse than regret in science. That's, that, that's, that's, that's pretty much, um, I, I, don't know, I hope that answered the question, uh, charged as much as I could. Yeah, it definitely does. And that, that brought back the fact, because during my college years and um, you know, even in earlier years, like I was always someone who was very shy, um, very much an introvert. And so it was for me personally, like really hard, especially when you're in the, in, in the science field, 
it's about connections. You know, you have to get an internship, you have to have the connections. And I wasn't immediately the person to go out and venture out to find those connections. Um, so for any student who is sort of like shy or more on the introvert side, um, one of the things that or tactics that I tried was just like being present. I think the first step is just to, to show that it's something that you want, even if you don't have the answers right away. So be present. So not only does that mean showing up for class, you know, um, sometimes I would honestly, you know, book office hours with my professor or that person that I wanted to meet with, you know, just to have a cat and I'll literally make up what I wanted to talk to that professor about like maybe an hour before, you know, before seeing them, um, partially because I wanted them to know who I was. Um, so that they know your face, they know your name, they know that you're interested in this. Um, and it wasn't like me going to these large events because those things like made me like really anxious and nervous. So, so being present, sitting in the front of the class, and even if it was a space, you know, I, I think one of the experiences just like being one, you know, of the, you know, little of the, you know, black females in the classroom especially as I got into my major classes, um, there weren't many people who looked like me. So you had to be seen, and I'm sure I was seen, you know, but at the same time, being in the front of the class, letting it be known that I'm here was, was one thing that I uh, tried to do to, to get over that hump. Yeah, and if I could add on to that, um, something that, that also I think would have helped me when I was younger is, um, to just always try your best to do your best at everything that you do. Um, just give it your 110%, even if it's not necessarily what you want to do at that moment, um, but an opportunity presents itself, go ahead and go for it. Go for it and give it your 110% best um, because a lot of the times what happens is that that's going to open up an opportunity for you down in the future because you met somebody while you were doing that or somebody saw the work that you did um, and was like, oh, I remember you, you know, didn't you do something about that, right? So allow yourself to be remembered by people. Um, it's really funny because one of my colleagues um, today, actually, she emailed me about something, uh, you know, some a project that we're working on. And then she was like, PS, by the way, do you know, this and this person and this and this person? And I was like, Oh, my gosh, yeah, yeah, I do. They were my professors in college. Um, and so for a second there, I had to think back and be like, wait, what did I do good in those classes? Like, are they gonna say something bad about me? And I, it felt good to be like, no, you know what? I, I did pretty good in those classes. And I actually did an internship with one of those professors. So I think she has something good to say about me. And I'm like, okay, you know, thank goodness that I did something right. And that I did my best at everything that I could possibly do. Because now, um, you know, now my coworker is like, oh, I work with that person. And, and even with that, just having those connections, who knows, might be able to help me in the future as well, you know? Um, so always just give your, your best, 110%, give it all you got, even if it's not necessarily what you wanna do right now or in the future, that opportunity could open up a lot of doors for you in the future. So just wanted to say that. Awesome, thanks, Tatiana. Uh, James, the next question is for you. Um, so whether, was there ever a time where you felt really discouraged in your work or during your education? And how do you stay inspired and motivated to keep going? Yeah, I can think of when I was uh, defending my, um, after the first two years of class in my doctorate, you have to take your qualifying exams. And I actually failed uh, the first time I went up. And I was extremely discouraged then. Um, but I came from a family that was really loving and supportive. And I also always held on to my dream because I wanted to be a professor at an HBCU. And so once I had my cry and, 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 and took some time off, I went back to restudying for the exams and tapped into my resources, which would be my friends, my family, my church, um, and just refueled my tanks again and went for it again. And I think one of the, the biggest things for me is that I knew that I could make a difference um, and I knew that I could contribute and that would give me the fuel to actually want to try again because there were times after I failed that I was just gonna give up and do something else. Um, but just thinking that uh, this means something, I'll be the first graduate student in my immediate family, for sure the first doctorate in my family. 
Um, and then my department had not graduated an African-American male since 1959. And so that means I would be a trailblazer there too and, and be a symbol um, uh, for folks that followed behind me and that were there too. And so those were a lot of things that I just had to add to the fuel tank to try again and to get back on my horse. And it was hard, but I did pass the second time. And I eventually did get my doctorate from University of Michigan. Um, so what I would suggest to the students is that when they get discouraged, that they find their mentors, they find the people that could put gasoline back in their tank, they look for their support systems, um, they reach out, don't be afraid. Um, I think Tariq was talking about failure, don't be afraid because it's going to happen. And sometimes you learn more from failure than success. And, and just do whatever. James, I think you went out a little bit there. Um, so when, whenever you're able to, to get back on, um, we will continue on. But yeah, I think some of the points that James was mentioning were uh, amazing. The fact that we were talking once again about support. I'm not sure if anyone here on the call is either being a first or a trailblazer in any way, whether it be um, in their families, being the first to go to college or being the first to succeed. But there's a lot of pressure being sometimes a minority in some of these fields. Um, but don't be afraid to continue on. Um, so yeah, what James was saying was, you know, just right on point. Um, so I guess we'll go on to, so Jabril, the next question is for you. Um, so we work with a lot of students who are in the maritime or interested in the maritime field or industry. And so we were wondering, you know, like what does an in-service engineer agent do and how often do you get to work on large naval ships? Is that something that you get the opportunity to do? Uh, thank you for that question. It's funny. Uh, your a direct answer is that's what we do all the time. Um, an in-service engineering agent uh, is a paired term that goes with whatever engineering discipline you're in, whether it be naval, material science, uh, mechanical, electrical, etc. cetera. Uh, we provide a series of things, whether it be distance support in the form of obsolescence. This part has um, gone obsolete, needs to be replaced in a certain time frame to support ship's force so that they can continue to uh, go forward in their mission and um, sail the seas and have the different ship systems and components work at optimal levels, right? Uh, in addition to distance support, we'll do things like review technical manuals that go over the uh, different uh, procedures and actual components and diagrams within a specific system and update things like that and things like that like that as well. And when it comes to travel, so we definitely travel a lot. I've been places anywhere from Virginia to uh, Mayport, Florida, to San Diego, to Hawaii and Japan, all for uh, going on a ship, being able to service a specific system, whether it be for inspection, validation, uh, design uh, constraints and design changes and things of that nature. So it's definitely a big part, a big percentage of what I do and those that I work with. Um, and as far as the system specifically, I work in uh, sonar. So um, the sonar system has a pressurization system that I go forward and perform grooms on and everything and then other combat support systems within my group. And another just quick follow-up question. How many um, women do you work with, you know, in your particular um, department? It's funny. So like uh, my command or my job, if you will, has several thousand uh employees and in my direct group it's pretty diverse from age to uh sex as well i work with a few women you know above five in my direct group which is like 40 or so um offhand so it, it's definitely uh within like my immediate group within my actual code or actual department it's a good amount it's definitely a good amount who are all either anywhere from entry level to senior level engineers financial um uh uh, advisors or accounting type people to program and project managers work in a lot of different areas. Awesome. Because we work, um, so through the Bay University Project, we work with um, the New York Harbor School. If you have a chance and you aren't aware of the New York Harbor School, I recommend everyone just like look it up. But it's a, a maritime high school. So students in New York City, they're learning different maritime careers, whether it's um, navigating on boats, how to do marine research, 
um, how to scuba dive, the only school, high school in the nation that teaches high school students how to scuba dive and they're getting certified. Um, so students were actually able to go to the Bahamas where Bradley's from uh, to get certified. And that was one of the programs that both me and Bradley was able to do in the Bahamas. And Tatiana, you actually studied in a Luther as well. So, so Bradley, I'm gonna push the next question to you. Um, and that question is, so when you think of students, we're thinking of Bahamas in a sense of tourism, you know, like it's very big on tourism. So is there, is there ever a time where protecting natural areas um, combats tourism? Like, are you guys fighting for space or how does that work? So, uh, it, it, yeah, that's a very deep question because with tourism, it's almost like there's two things with tourism. You can either be a destination where people are going just because it's cheap and you have access to the beach and there's somebody there to mix your drinks. Or you can go on a vacation um, where you're going to see something. Like we have a, a barrier reef in the Bahamas. It's the second largest barrier reef in the world. If somebody's coming to see that reef, they're going to be a totally different kind of person, right? And it's almost like just having somebody come in your neighborhood. Like, you know, there's somebody's driving through your neighborhood because it's in between where they're going and where they're trying to get. They're not going to respect that space the way it's like if they were coming to your neighborhood because you had the biggest oak tree in that neighborhood or you were having a festival down the street or something, you know? So we always have to combat, you know, is this person coming on a cruise ship and they're not really interested in spending that much money in the Bahamas and they're going to have these negative impacts. Cruise ships transport a lot of waste. Um, typically, they are looking to dispose of that waste outside the US so that they don't have many negative impacts, etc. cetera. Um, so it's, it's basically just like any business. You wanna market to somebody who appreciates the value of your product. And uh, that's what we're trying to move towards in the Bahamas, um, trying to market the uniqueness of our islands. Um, and I, I wanna do that as a person myself, you know, I'm, uh, you, wanna, you wanna market your unique aspects in any situation. And uh, that's really the difference between a tourist who's coming and is going to respect your place and is going to be willing to invest in the experience. And they, they would be willing to stay at a accommodation that doesn't use as much electricity. And it might not be as cool at night, but, you know, you have that satisfaction of doing something the way that you wanted to do it, you know. Um, and so that's really our challenge here in the Bahamas. Specifically, there's a, a national park where we have parrots. And it's the only place where these parrots nest in the Bahamas on the ground. There's one other island and these parrots nest in trees on that island. So in this park, you have pine trees going up super high, it's extremely beautiful place. You have parrots on the ground nesting. And there's a company that wants to put a cruise ship port like right offshore right there. So if you imagine, you know, that would introduce uh, pet, you know, pets, so dogs and cats that are gonna harm those parrots as they nest on the ground. It's gonna increase the number of people that are in the area. You're gonna have rats and other pests come around just because we're developing this area. Um, but the, the community there is extremely interested in having this development come because they need jobs. And so it's, con it's a constant balancing act of giving nature what it needs and giving people what they need. Um, and so tourism is a double-edged sword. It's a double-edged sword. And, and so many people visit the Bahamas, even I do, like almost every year. So it's, it's definitely something that I think about if I'm, you know, attributing to a problem or if I'm, you know, making it better. So being very aware or conscious. Uh, so Yadira, I'm going to move to you. Can you talk about what are some like out of the box skills? Because you're an educator, right? Um, and so what are some out of the box skills that you might have that uh, are useful when it comes to teaching? When it comes to teaching, oh, <laughs> or just um, like STEM, or just like doing science and robotics or coding, yeah. Um, so just like out of the box things that one might not initially think of. Um, well, this might come as a bit of a surprise, but it's not so much. I, I would say it's not technical skills. It's something that we've been talking about, and it's kind of like those social and emotional learning skills that yes, you're gonna fail, but no one's there to explain like, okay, but this is your, this is the opportunity to rise to the occasion. Like building that resilience is, it's, it's trying and, and it can definitely be enough for you to just wanna walk away. I believe James, when you were speaking about um, failing, uh, when you had to defend your dissertation, you're like, I just wanna walk away. I absolutely, I wanted to be like, me too. <laughs> 
Um, and so what I think even in, well, in any field really, like it's how do you, tapping into those emotions and feelings and figuring out processing like oh this really feels gratifying like in this area of stem i'm able to be curious i'm able to explore um and then how to persevere when you find challenges and you look around and there aren't people that look like you in that case like how to keep going forward because i think one of the i think one of the things that um is common for minorities in stem is feeling like you have that imposter syndrome and knowing that okay that exists but this is how i'm going to keep moving on um and and being really resourceful with how to push through and find resources or that support network that i was referring to earlier um but i think that there's definitely some uh crossover with the way i teach like this like uh, my background is in policy like in education policy so i came i came into the game much too late to to try to compete with younger people so i really had to think about like okay where is the disconnect when it when it comes to introducing some of these high concepts to kids and younger kids who might not speak english right so a lot of it was visual a lot of a lot of the stuff i was doing was tactile and um figuring out those entry points so um so in that process i also had to challenge the way i thought about the about tech and and make it as creative and tactile as possible and um and so there's certainly and i didn't have anyone to look to right i was just like okay figure this out here we go um and so just being comfortable with um uh with being in 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 a field that you might not have the technical skills but also thinking about the strengths you bring to um to the work i think that that's extremely important important and it can carry you pretty far both as a, an educator but also as a student yeah i had a quick Jane. thing um mm -hmm. one thing that i communicate to my son upstairs is communication on oh, no, on broke again we can hear you we can hear you yes I think yeah so once james get back get back on we'll be able to hopefully connect again um but yeah like some of the things that you were mentioning yadira um and, and it just makes me jog back to that podcast that i was listening to and in this podcast was speaking specifically about culture and language and how that's useful when it comes to the way students are learning uh stem or science um and he, he, he gave a, a really cool example that I thought was super funny, you know, like sometimes when it comes to, you know, like science and these videos that are mostly American videos, students are listening to or watching videos that have like these British accents, or they're reading about ecosystems um, and all of the examples of ecosystems are places that are not local to them. So it gives this impression that like, you know, science is not in your backyard. Science is not something you can find in your home. Science is something that is not for you. And so because of these little things, I don't think, you know, we were necessarily thinking about it in that way of, as it being not inclusive. Um, the students who are receiving this information um, can easily feel unwelcome. So, and I think in your case, the students and the families that you're working with, Yadira, um, a lot of them, you know, are learning not only words in English, but concepts. You know, so they're learning two things at once. And I think Sunset Spark does a, a great job at making it welcoming and, and warm and sort of like digestible. And there's uh, not the pressure to like, okay, you want to do coding to, to get money or to, to be, you know, to have the American dream, but to make it fun. Um, so that was awesome. James, before we get to the, sorry, before we get to the last question, I believe you wanted to add on and then Jabril will go to you. Yeah, just real quick, uh, one of the things that I talked to my son about is being able to communicate science. He's into computer science. And so I remember one time I was interviewing for a job and they asked me, explain a time when I had to take a tough scientific concept and break it down to where a regular person could understand. And I thought about the time I had to talk about food safety to my son's third grade class. And so anytime that our STEM students can learn how to communicate very complicated and intricate ideas to where their grandmother or their mother or their cousin can understand it, that will get them ready when they have a chance to communicate to potential funders or the elevator conversation that we hear about 
or when you're applying for a job, because not everyone that interviews you is going to know all the technical aspects of your STEM background. And so trying to teach the students how to communicate, communicate clearly and well, but also simply, I think is a big aspect. And it's something that wasn't taught to me in graduate school, but it's something I had to learn because I have talked to a number of different types of audience at different science levels. And it helped me with the effectiveness of my communication. Yeah. How was that communicating with the third graders? How'd that go? Uh, I bought coloring books <laughs> that had concepts of food safety. I said, have you ever gotten sick and have you ever, you know, thrown up and so on and so forth after eating something. So if you get it down to the yuck factor, um, they kind of like, you know, key into that and then the whole coloring books and, and all the rest of that really helps. So. Yeah, kids love coloring books and yucky things. If I yeah. can attribute to two of those, kids love coloring books and yucky things. Yeah. Yes, awesome. Yeah. Uh, Jabril, uh, you can give the last part and then Tatiana's gonna give the last question before we end. Yeah, uh, if I may just add, you know, a lot of, we've mentioned so many great things as it pertains to really what it means to see yourself in the picture as one who is a student um, in front of a being blessed to receive STEM. And I think a lot of times, even beyond the how eloquent you are, how you reduce it to its lowest terms when it's being articulated, is physically seeing yourself in the picture. I was blessed to be a seventh and eighth grade long-term substitute math and science teacher at Antonia Pantoja Charter. It's a bilingual school where they taught the students Every student, when they graduated, in addition to all the curriculum, they were fluent in both English and Spanish. And one of the things that the students really had never seen is a young black male in front of them, not just teaching them something, but teaching them physics, chemistry, algebra, geometry. And that in of itself starts to change and rearrange the actual mindset of how you even view STEM at all. Uh, in addition to the fact that you might be shown things from a British action or shown things outside of where you live, the person that you hear about, whether it's Newton, Pythagoras, Aristotle, you know, all these people, they don't look like you, right? But when you start to hear about, if it's black history, and you start to hear about people who invented the super soaker, soaker helped with the light bulb, electricity, uh, the radiator, these things that are used or Benjamin Banneker and the whole layout of the Washington Mall, these are these as a black person, you, you start to just be more interested off there and you start to even see that something that was foreign to you or something that you did not were unable to really grasp before becomes that much easier. And I'll just end with this. Some several years ago, there was a experiment done where students took a test before President Obama became president. And they all didn't do well, these black students. They took the same test or gave them that same test after he became president and they all passed with flying colors. Just showing the power of when someone seems to do the impossible that looks like you and then seems to come from where you come from, you can do things leaps and bounds ahead of where you thought you could. And that's, that's all I have. Awesome, so I think it, it goes to show that representation definitely matters. Um, so before we end, um, Tatiana is just going to ask one last question. I know we're pushing for time, but I do want to give everyone a, a, a moment to just like share their last thoughts. So Tatiana, you have the floor. All righty. So just wanted to ask you guys this last question. What can we do to support students who are interested in STEM? Can you share any advice, any programs, any internship resources with these students? Anything that you think can help them? Um, get started in, in system. And then, um, Rosie, if you want to talk about STEM from dance, um, I know most students now are in this because of COVID, you know, like what are some resources, as Tatiana mentioned, programs, if they're internships, um, people that they can talk to. Um, so, Rosie, if you wanted to just chat a little bit about STEM from dance to begin, and we'll bounce around um, as we go along. Sure. Um, so. We have a summer program called Girls Rise Up and we're taking applications now. Um, good. Find more information on our website, stemfromdance.org. Um, but we, in this summer, we're gonna have a virtual program and it will be for two set, two weeks. 
dance um, a session and girls are going to create their own dance and they're going to learn um, animation, motion capture. So they're going to learn to code all these awesome effects um, onto these videos and then we're going to have a showcase at the end. So a lot of this process is going to be interacting with other girls who are also interested in STEM, also interested in dance. Um, listening to women come in and talk about their experiences in the STEM fields um, and learning kind of the different things you can do because you don't really know what career you could follow, right? It sounds like you could just do, you're a software engineer, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, that's it. Um, but these women are doing such amazing things that you're like, wow, I didn't think that was even possible. So having that opportunity to also explore within the STEM field, something we offer, I think that would be really exciting for someone who's just interested in seeing what's out there. Um, and our deadline is May 31st. Um, so I encourage girls to definitely apply. Um, I think it'll be a great experience and there's gonna be dancing. So you're not gonna be <laughs> just in front of a computer, you're gonna be moving. Um, and a piece of advice I would offer is to take your education into your own hands. I think um, it's easy to rely on what schools can offer us and then that's it. If my school doesn't have a club for it, if it doesn't have a class for it, then I guess I'm not studying it. There's so many other programs available out there um, and some are, are free, right? That you can do and explore on your own and see what, it's, what it can offer you. And maybe you don't follow a career in STEM, but maybe that's something you do on the side. Maybe that's a hobby you do. So whatever it is you're interested in, I think um, you should do some research and see where else you can get it if your school is not offering it. Awesome. Perfect. And so what I'm also going to do, I know it's like three o'clock now, but I, and so if you have to absolutely go, then I completely understand. Um, but if everyone can just bear with me for just a couple more minutes, I promise I, you know, I'm trying to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, Yadira, do you want to, or anyone else, feel free to talk about your programs. So as mentioned this video, you know, students, parents, other community scientists might be watching this video. So advice, programs, resources, um, Yadira? Yeah, um, I think just kind of circling back to um, my earlier message is, you know, uh, starting to create your um, network of support. I think that's going to be really important as you, um, as you continue to deepen your interest in STEM, because it's not just going to be a one-shot deal, right? You're going to keep looping back and, and widening your interest. So um, think about that, both in home and outside of the home. Um, in terms of plugging any programs, we do have a live uh, streaming show um, it, on uh, YouTube and Twitch. Uh, actually, we have a couple of different ones, so I'm just going to quickly plug those. Tequitos, it's a Latinx tech history <laughs> DIY <laughs> mess of things um, that's uh, hosted by me on Wednesdays. It's um, for families and young uh, makers. Um, we also have coding for young artists on um, Tuesdays, and we do like live robotics building, um, and uh, and oh, and also um, yeah, if you guys uh, tune in um, and send us a message, we can send free um, DIY like maker kits um, to students who are interested. Uh, all low cost stuff, but they all kind of adhere to some of the stuff that we talk about in the programs. Um, and that's all we have for now. And thank you so much for doing this. This, is, this was amazing. Awesome, awesome. Anyone else? Any resources, advice, programs? Tariq, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, so well, first and foremost, I, want, I just want to say this was an awesome uh, panel. I, I really do hope to work with each and every one of you uh, in the future. Um, just to kind of go into what me and Jabril do with Original Man Scientific. So as mentioned before, we're a research and development company. So we literally turn um, young people or anyone for that matter into scientists and engineers before they even step foot in college if they haven't been in college and before they ever step foot in industry if they haven't been in industry yet. So we really want to help them build their creative minds, teach them what they need to know and then use that to help build their ideas, their inventions, their innovations. They would eventually become so somewhat uh, become somewhat of a talent, so to speak, with Original Man Scientific. They would sign on. Um, they would have exclusive access to all the resources that we have, whether it be product design, manufacturing. Uh, we partner with 
uh, laboratories and, and different types of uh, scientific spaces in your uh, area. So say for example, if, I, if Jabril is in Philadelphia and there's somebody there that has an idea to develop a, uh, a pharmaceutical or some, someone that has an idea, idea to develop um, uh, a different type of paint that can go into your uh, into your house that could, you know, pretty much avoid or, or pretty just pretty much uh, repel radioactive uh, radiate ra radioactive waves or something like that. Uh, I'm just you know giving you examples. Um, this the company that we have set up can help you pretty much from the idea all the way to the intellectual property. So we cover the entire ground. So another unique thing about what we do, um, and you can visit our website at omansci.com. That's omansci.com. One of the uh, one another unique thing about our company is that we help you own your science. So if there's something you came up with, if there's some type of procedure that you want to be applied in a laboratory setting, in a warehouse or, or an industrial plant, we want to make sure that you have exclusive rights to that particular product design or method so that whenever someone wants to use it or or apply it in whatever they're doing they have to go through you there's no uh university telling you to hey in your contract you can't uh have have complete exclusive rights to whatever it is that you develop all of that all of that again all of that belongs to you that's about it awesome awesome um anyone else otherwise we'll go into some bop things and we'll wrap up okay awesome um so before we end i want to thank everyone round of applause for everyone being on this call today you guys were awesome such a strong panel um and i want to just let the students know if you're watching this video i'm gonna send it out uh, next week so today i should have mentioned this in the beginning Today is May 22nd, 2020. So by the time you're getting this video, it's probably a, a couple of days after this panel was recorded. But the Bay Oyster Project, we have a research symposium that we do every year. And so with this research symposium, students are able to present the research that they've been working on. Um, sometimes it's a, a year long project that they've been working on. But this year, it's going to be a virtual symposium week. So from June 5th until June 12th. So if you're watching this video before June 5th, I recommend every student, community scientist, you know, you can submit a project to the Bay Oyster Project. And then from June 5th until June 10th, we're gonna be reviewing those projects. So you'll be able to sit with a team of reviewers and talk about what you did. And we are accepting anything from comic strips to videos, to songs that you've made, as long as it pertains to New York Harbor. And then on June 12th, um, that's when the final celebration is going to be. So if you have any comments about that, feel free to reach out to me um, about the symposium. And the last plug that I wanna do, so as a part of our work with Pace University and the National Science Foundation, um, we're asking the BOP community to help promote a student survey. Um, for New York City middle and high school students currently. We may open it up to students who are outside of the New York City area, um, but this online survey is voluntary, it's confidential, but it does ask for parental consent. And so information from this survey will help improve how we promote student interest in STEM activities and career. So if you are interested, you're a student in New York City middle or high school, um, the survey can be found at bit.ly, so bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash B-O-P study. I'm going to share a link with everyone um, in an email, so with your teacher. So look forward to that link. Um, those who are on the call, I can also just share the link in a, the chat box. But it's just a survey just to help us, you know, um, improve the way that we do STEM and promoting that to students. So thank you once again to everyone who was on the, the call. Big shout out to everyone. And even though we passed the time limit, you guys are troopers. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day. All right. All right. Have a great one. Have a good one.